The British made their first foray into the world of bombers in World War I. But there wasn't much progress in that field during the interwar period. Despite that, by the early 1930s, there were two distinct bomber forces available to the British. Bombers of the Fleet Air Arm, eventually under the direct control of the Admiralty, and the forces of the RAF Bomber Command. After the Nazis seized power, Germany's ever-increasing air capabilities prompted the British to respond in kind by supercharging their efforts to have a strong bombing arm. During the early 1930s, the Air Ministry issued several specifications seeking bombers of several designs, with lots of proposals coming in from British companies. So, shortly afterwards, several new bombers were accepted into service. First of all, we simply have to mention the Bristol Blenheim, an incredible British bomber. It had considerable range limitations and, by the start of the Second World War, was severely outdated. But air crews loved it due to its excellent handling characteristics, reliability and robust design. It's no coincidence that the Blenheim was later chosen as the basis for the Beaufort torpedo bomber, which led to the fearsome multi-role Bowfighter. In the middle of the decade, the Blenheim was joined by a heavier design, the Handley Page Hamden, famously compared <laughs> to a flying suitcase due to its unusual looks. But the most interesting British bomber of the time was the iconic Vickers Wellington, created by the genius of Barnes Wallace and his engineering team. A key feature of the aircraft was its unique geodetic airframe fuselage structure. The Wellington took longer to assemble than comparable aircraft, but the procedure itself was fairly simple, which allowed factories to build it with the help of employees with relatively low skill levels. At the same time, the bomber's fuselage turned out to be very resilient to damage and, most importantly, very light. Think about it. Being only three meters shorter than the legendary B-17 Flying Fortress, and with only two engines at its disposal, the British bomber had an operational range of up to 3,000 kilometers. It was this original trio, the Blenheim, the Hamden, and the Wellington, that delivered the first strikes on Nazi military targets after the war broke out in Europe. When it came to developing their bombing capabilities, the Royal Navy was no slouch either. From the early stages of the war, the British employed a variety of torpedo bombers. One of those was the legendary Swordfish, a biplane torpedo bomber famous for its successful use against the Italian Navy during the Battle of Taranto. Then we have to mention the short Sunderland an extremely powerful flying boat, known for its massive size. It wasn't a part of the Navy per se, serving with the RAF from the very beginning, but it was frequently employed at sea as a patrol bomber and also in the anti-submarine role. Feeling the need for a reliable carrier-based dive bomber, the British also purchased Vought Vindicators from the US. The aircraft was given the name Chesapeake, in British service. As the sky above the Channel became a fierce battleground between British and German pilots and bombs kept falling on British soil, the Bomber Command, led by Sir Arthur Harris, was getting ready for a counter-offensive. The British were to receive a new trio of aircraft vastly different from their predecessors. They were four-engined heavy strategic bombers capable of delivering their payloads to basically hmm, any part of Nazi Germany. The first aircraft of the three to be introduced into service with the RAF was the Stirling Bomber, developed and built by Short. Engineers of the company simply took the Sunderland wing, built a new fuselage round it, and succeeded in making a giant aircraft 
capable of carrying a massive bomb load, putting it in a class of its own. Unfortunately, the otherwise excellent aircraft had some problems with the altitude ceiling and its max speed, so it was quickly followed by two more compact and more nimble bombers. First, the Handley Page Halifax, and then the famous Avro Lancaster, a four-engine version of the Avro Manchester. Right to the very end of the war, those three were the bane of Nazis' cities, factories, and transport hubs, attacking countless targets during night bombing raids, while the Halifax was employed as a classic strategic bomber, performing routine strategic bombing missions against the Axis powers. The Avro Lancaster also made a name for itself as a dam buster. During Operation Chastise, a special unit of Lancaster bombers managed to carry out an attack on several dams of the Ruhr Valley under the cover of night. They succeeded in destroying several hydroelectric power stations, delivering a massive blow to German production in the region. A little bit later, the trio was joined by the Avro Lincoln, sometimes also called the Australian Lancaster. The Lincoln was, in fact, the development of the Lancaster bomber, perfect for long-range missions in the Pacific due to the adoption of stronger, longer span and larger fuel tanks. Australians also fixed one of the biggest weaknesses of British bombers by upgrading its defensive capabilities. At the time, the British didn't produce a single high-caliber machine gun, and for the longest time there was a shortage of 20mm cannons as well. These problems were alien to Australia. It received a large number of Browning machine guns from the US and also produced Hispano cannons en masse, stunning London with seemingly impossible numbers. Later, the Lincoln became the base for the Avro Shackleton, a long-range maritime patrol aircraft that was in service right up until 1984. Now we move to the post-war era, which in War Thunder is mostly represented by tactical bombers. Here, we simply have to speak about the English Electric Canberra, a highly adaptable breakthrough aircraft, which was also licensed produced in the US. It performed so well and was so reliable that it was employed by the RAF right up until 2006, outlasting most of its contemporaries like the French Vautour or the Soviet Il-28. This bomber was adopted for such a wide variety of tasks, both in military and civilian use, that it's literally impossible to list them all in one single video. And finally, there is the Blackburn Buccaneer, a carrier-capable bomber which was employed both by the Navy and the Royal Air Force and only retired in 1993. Obviously, the operational history of post-war British bombers doesn't have as many pages as one of their piston predecessors, but it's only fair to say that they served their country well. And isn't it the only thing that really matters? What do you think about British bombers and their history? Please, tell us in the comments below. We'd love to know.